interesting uh, time because it's an opportunity uh, to call and question what you have heard. If you don't believe what you heard today, this is the time to question it. And uh, as uh, the scriptures teach, uh, we ought to be ready to give an answer to every man. That's right. And so I believe these men are ready to do just that. So at this time, I want to open up the questions to you. To stand where you are and uh, state your question. Now, you won't be able to debate the question here, uh, but you can state the question. We'll give them an opportunity to ask you a question. If you're not satisfied, we will allow you to do a follow-up question. And not a debate, but a follow-up question. And of course, if that doesn't satisfy you, then uh, we'll prepare to remain after this discussion and talk uh, more privately with you about what, you, uh, uh, what your concern might be. So at this time, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you have a Bible question. All right. I had a question. With all the churches that are out here, how do I know where, what church, the right church, I should be going to? All right, so brother. All right. So that's just a wonderful question. The question is with the prevalence of other churches, how do we know definitively which church that we should be attending in accordance with the Bible? Now throughout my discourse, I made the point that there is one church, and that was a syllogism we derived from the Bible. In the book of Ephesians chapter four, verse number four, the Bible says that there is one body. In Ephesians 1.23, the Bible says that the body is the church. So if there is one body and the body is the church, that means that there is only one church. And I use that figuratively because we can read in Acts chapter 7, verse number 39, that when Stephen was preaching to the Sanhedrin, he talked about the church in the wilderness. And that makes reference to the children of Israel when they were called out by way of being a congregation in the old dispensation. But in this Christian dispensation, the Bible says that Matthew 16 and 18, as Brother Shaw preached, upon this rock I will build my church. The word church makes reference to the concept of ecclesia, or being called out, yes, being sir. called out. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, the Bible says, praising God and having favor with all of the people, and the Lord added to the church, which in the original language means to them, which makes reference to the apostles once they had received the word. And so the underscore of your question, it relates to doctrine. It relates to doctrine. It's a church that you can read about in your Bible and also has the right doctrine. So it's not just about putting up the nomenclature Church of Christ on the building. Because that doesn't mean that we are in alliance with the practices of all right, God. All right. The term Church of Christ, Romans 16, 16, is in the Bible. Salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. But it also was Romans 6, 17 through 18, where the Bible says, thanks be to God. Yes. I'm going to repeat that because y'all ain't saying amen. amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Not your lucky stars. Amen. Not your lucky number. Amen. Not your lucky rabbit's foot. Amen. Rabbit wasn't lucky if you got his foot. <laughs> Thanks be to God that you were once the servants of sin, but now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered. Don't you me, ever tell me the type of teaching is not important. So you have to have the right name, and you have to read, have the right doctrine, both of which you can read about in your Bible. And so the term obeying the gospel is in three scriptures. It is in three scriptures in the New Testament. It is a term of art. Brother Shaw said you cannot preach another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 8. So obeying the gospel will allow you to be a member of the church of Christ. Say that. And so in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 15 and 16, he quotes Isaiah and says, who's going to believe our report? Yes, but sir. they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's right. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses number 7 through 8, it talks about Jesus coming back with the clouds and with many Say angels yes. and with firing. Yes. He's a fire. Yes. Firing vengeance yes. on all those who love not the truth and have not obeyed the gospel. Yes. People say, what is the gospel? It's not Yolanda Adams and Kirk Franklin and that genre of music. It is the message to be obeyed so that you can be saved. 
And finally, we, as we made reference to in the sermon, 1 Peter chapter 4, and verses number 17 through 18, where the Bible says the judgment must begin at the household of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, how is anybody going to be saved that obeys not the gospel? The gospel is what you need to do in order to be saved, which means to be added to the church of Christ, as we read, read about in the Bible, based upon that form of doctrine that we receive from the Bible. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Let me just add to that particular thought in terms of specificity. Obeying the gospel includes your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but not only your faith, because some people think that you are saved at the point of your faith. Yeah. Listen, your faith must lead you to obey what God has said. Mm -hmm. Repentance is change of heart, and then your confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then you must be baptized in water. As Brother Shaw pointed out, you cannot be saved first and then baptized because you are saved. No, you are lost until you've been baptized in Christ. Say okay. that it's for the remission of sins. Yes, sir. And so that's obeying the gospel. All right. And if you don't do that, you believe, but your faith is just in your mind. It's not true Bible faith that leads you to do what God said in the All same right. way All right. he said uh, to do it. Are there other questions? Yes, there was a question asked by a uh, non-Christian. How essential is baptism? Salvation. How essential? All right, Brother Shaw, you want to ask? All right. First of all, if we look at Matthew 28, 19, and 20, when we have the command to go to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mm -hmm. That wasn't somebody else talking, that was Jesus. That's it, man. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, go into all of the world and preach mm -hmm. the gospel. <laughs> Jesus said, he that believes the gospel and is baptized shall be saved. Brother Omar told us this morning from the scripture, Christ cannot lie. And if he said it, it's going to have to come to pass. Uh -huh. Mark 16, 15 and 16 <coughs> teaches the same thing. But the main thing that I want you to understand is that Romans 6, 17, that God be thanked that you were a servant of sin. Yes. But you have obeyed from the heart, as he quoted, that form of doctrine. Well, how does faith come? So then faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you hear the word, then it will build your faith. But you can play with it and miss it still. You have to obey the gospel. And Jesus put salvation after baptism. You have to be baptized. That's how essential it is. You can't change it, and you can't say, I'll wait to be baptized tomorrow. If you walk down, you need to do it right away. Amen. Because putting it off, when I was in another church, it was three months before I was baptized. If I had died in between the three months, I'd have been lost just like right now. You know, I've been still lost because you can't be baptized by following a false teaching. You have to have the truth. And it takes both of them. The truth and the faith and washing away these things. Mm -hmm. All that must be together. I have no more. It's good. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. I'm going to quickly add because Brother Shaw's point was absolutely sound. But just for posterity, as I know we're on. Uh, uh, recorded. Also, First Peter chapter three, verse number twenty-one. Yes, sir. The Bible says the light figure, in reference to the flood, a soul saved by water. Mm -hmm. The light figure, born to baptism, now doth even also yeah. save us, yes. not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but as an answer of a good conscience unto God by the resurrection. 
And so we go down in the water in order to get the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because three things agree on the earth. First John chapter 5, verse number 7, which is the water, the blood, and the spirit. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, and verse number 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And Jesus described the process, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5, that we are washed in his blood. Hebrews 10 and 22, let us draw near to God, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And so that's why the Bible makes the doctrinal point that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And you cannot be baptized into a denomination because there is one baptism, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 5. And the biblical proof for that proposition is Acts 19, 1 through 5, when the followers of Apollos at the upper coast of Corinth they had already received the baptism of John. That's right. The baptism of John had biblical authority at one time. That's right. But now they were in the Christian dispensation. Uh -huh. And they had not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit, even though we were baptized by the authority of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, that's done right. And Paul said unto them, what were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. They had already gone down to the water, but the teaching wasn't right. right. And the Bible says that they baptized them. Right. And after that, they received the Holy Spirit. Right. So the teaching has to be correct. It has to be into the one church. And in order to be saved, you have to be baptized into the one church. Amen. 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 I think I saw a question in the back. Uh, my question is, how can we separate the two? Um, I know we all stomp our feet a little bit when we hear a good song and, you know, it catches our attention. But why can't we clap also? I mean, they're kind of the same thing. They're both emotional acts. So how can we distinct the two of stomping our feet and clapping our hands and et cetera? All right, little man. So I, I'm going to go back a little bit because I made the point about clapping. So I want to go back and deal with it in all three dispensations. There's a patriarchal dispensation, there's a mosaic dispensation, and now we are living in the Christian dispensation. And so a perspective of clapping, there's nothing new under the sun. But the Bible says that clapping is just as soon associated with scorn in both the patriarchal and the mosaic dispensation. Right. For your notes, you can read Job chapter 27 and verse number 23, where clapping was a sound unto the Lord as scorn. In the Mosaic Dispensation, you can read Ezekiel chapter 25 and verse number 6, Ezekiel chapter 6 and verse number 11, and Nahum chapter 3 and verse number 19, where clapping is not an association of rejoicing or joy, but is literally scorn unto God. Now we are in the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. And the Bible says in the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17 that whatsoever we do by word or deed, we have to do all by the authority of Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 21, where the Bible makes reference to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. So the proponent has to make the case that clapping is commensurate with the New Testament. Now, if it's in the previous dispensations, don't tell me that if it was in accordance with God's word, it would not be written in the divine pages of inspiration. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse number 25, that God is not worshipped with men's hands as if he needs anything. So the byproduct of our hands can never be made by way of sound in order to praise God. We praise God with the fruit of our lips. Now, clapping has two connotations. It is either percussive, percussive meaning percussion, if you go to the Kanye West concert, you're going to get up and get the mic. Everybody put your hands together and clap. Ooh, that was a good concert because that was participatory. That's not the way we worship God. We worship God in spirit and in truth without any addition. And also clapping is done by way of applause. Uh, when it's the State of the Union and Barack Obama gets up and people will start clapping with something that they want to affirm. We don't affirm that way in worship. We affirm by saying 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 16, Amen. Now there are going to be incidentals as long as they are not percussive sounds by way of things that we do in the worship service in singing. Because there is no command to be stationary. But we don't add lifeless sounds that do not teach and do not edify in order to quote unquote lighten up worship and enhance. And so there is no percussive sound. You can't tell somebody, don't beat a drum, don't beat a snare, but you can bang your hands together at the 4 4 time and the 6 8 time. That literally makes no sense. And so the difference, if you're tapping to keep time, 
sound in and of yourself, and you're not making audible sounds for the congregation by way of percussion, that is distinguishable yeah. from literally bending your hands together in order to connote rhythm. We make melody with our voices. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.19 that melody is made in the heart. In the Old Testament, in Amos chapter 5, verse number 23, they were making the melody on the vials. The vials meaning the heart. But in the New Testament, when we sing, we make the melody in our heart and it is understandable words. 1 Corinthians 14.15, we sing with the understanding. Colossians 3 and 16, we teach one another. You don't teach anybody by banging your hands together. We don't teach anybody by making snaps or making percussive sounds. We sing the melody, and through the message and the content of the song, we are edified. And so I hope that that makes the distinction. If there are audible percussive sounds, now I can do this to create a bass line as well. We're seeing this in the Lord's Church as well. And that is also in violation just as if I'm banging my hands, just as, like, as if I'm beating a drum. And so everything that we do, we have to do all by the authority of Christ. And the sound that is a sweet-smelling savor that worships God is the fruit of the lips. Amen. 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 Excellent. This is just common sense. Amen. Common sense right now. We need to sit. There are people behind us sometimes listening and trying to take notes. Mm -hmm. We had to deal with this in our service one time. People came in that, from another church and they would stand up waving and they carrying on all that. Mm -hmm. And the folk behind them came to hear the truth. And I had to go and catch these folks to see what happened. And if you're blocking them out, whether they cannot hear or understand, then you're just as much a part of running them away as anything. And so what we have asked our members to do, find your seat, take your seat, and uh, unless we're asked to stand to commune or whatever, then keep your seat because somebody behind you is trying to find out what's being said. So we really need to go back to the old law of how the Church of Christ used to do that. We wanted folk to know what we were doing. We wanted them to understand what we were saying. And if you're jumping and playing, uh, we don't even, we try not to let parents, if, if the kids crying and acting up, we try to get somebody to get them out of there as quick as we can. Because People want to know what's right. They see, they hear all of this false teaching. And then when they go to hear the truth, and they're turned away by the way we act, then we are at fault. And so don't, don't make the job hard by just letting people jump up and sway and rock. Uh, I, I was at a church in Oklahoma. And uh, a lady came down the hall, down the aisle. Just to dance. She was, she was cutting a few steps. <laughs> and I saw one of the deacons. When she got in with him, he saw her and he just walked right up, put his arm around her, and politely told her, let's sit down and listen to what's being said. Amen. Sometimes it's, it's just a matter of us acting on what we ought to act upon. And don't be ashamed. We want folk to hear what God's word is saying. Yes. And if that's right, then we ought to make it possible for them to hear us. Amen. Amen. Other questions? He's here. <laughs> Okay. To Brother Omar and uh, Brother, uh, Brother Shaw, that um, how do y'all, when you're talking to a Baptist preacher and, uh, and, and a Baptist member separately, how do you bring them, how do you tell them about the gospel? Do you do it, how do, yeah, how do you distinguish, do you distinguish the, uh, the talk? 
talking to them about. The question is you're asking, you're asking how you teach a person who is a preacher in a denominational yes, body. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then a member, just a regular member that's not a preacher. That's also one of the questions. Uh, I think that sometimes people don't understand that there is a, a bifurcation, there's a separation in terms of approach. When you're dealing with someone who is supposed to be learned and someone who is more of a novice and not familiar with all things of the religions. And in fact, we'll see the Savior is going to take two different perspectives on the same truth. I remember in John 3 and 10, speaking to Nicodemus, when he was a uh, Pharisee, he said, aren't you a master of Israel? How in the world is it that you do not know this? Um, and so this was somebody who was supposed to be learned. And by the, the seaside, when he was talking to people like in John chapter 4 and the Samaritan woman, he takes much more of an approach to be able to build consensus as opposed to the Pharisees and the scribes who were purporting themselves to be religious, who he actually literally called a brood of vipers. Now we think that's harsh language. And when you're talking about the sepulcher and the grave, well, oh, why do you have to be so unloving? But the Bible says in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse number 11, as well as 2 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse number 10, that sharpness is a tool. And sharpness is a tool that is employed when someone is supposed to have known better. And the denominational Baptist pastor and uh, reverend and whatever have you, he is leading people astray. He is purporting himself to be a teacher. And so the approach there needs to be a little bit more stringent from my perspective because in James chapter 3 and verse number 1 regarding to the truth, the Bible says that be careful and not be not many masters because you are going to receive the greater condemnation. So whatever you teach, you need to be able to defend. But in all things, the Bible says that we need to be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. And I remember Jude describing in Jude verse number 22 the difference of approach. It says, on some have compassion and on some pull out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. And to answer your question succinctly, sister, I believe if you're dealing with somebody who is purporting themselves to be a teacher and influential, you need to enhance the sharpness of the rebuke, potentially. Whereas if you're dealing with someone who is completely ignorant and completely not uh, uh, versed in all things religious, we need to be long-suffering, we need to be forbearing, and we need to teach basically from a position of meekness because we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. They hear Church of Christ people coming up, oh, you Church of Christ, so therefore y'all in love, y'all ain't got no instrument, y'all ain't got no way, and, and they take an adversarial in a hostile tone. And with somebody who's a member who doesn't know better, we need to instruct in meekness and instruct in patience and be long-suffering. So I believe in the duality of the approaches. And for someone who is purporting themselves to be a religious teacher of significance, uh, I think that the rebuke oftentimes must be sharp because they are actively leading people astray. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 13 regarding false apostles who have transformed themselves into ministers of light. And I would add to that by simply saying that there are some church leaders who may fall into the category of, a, of an Apollos. And if that is the case, then of course you can have a different demeanor, much like uh, Brother Omar is saying, that a more humble, patient, as, as we see was the case uh, with Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, and sometimes the, the attitude that the person has will dictate to you just what approach you, you, you need to take. So keep that in mind, because some preachers, unfortunately, whatever the denomination might be, uh, many of them are very arrogant. Even if they don't, even though they cannot defend what they're saying, they are harsh, uh, they are, uh, they simply are stubborn-minded, they're not willing to listen, uh, to learn. And so I can understand uh, Jesus' disposition, and of course, the brother Omar is sharing that with us today. Sometimes, uh, when you approach a person like that, it's a matter of simply rebuking them and letting them know, as Jesus would say, let them alone. They'll be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both should fall to the ditch. So Jesus had a whole lot of patience with people who are just arrogant and, and just wouldn't listen. 
But there are people, you know, who are good-hearted people who are in denominational churches and who are looking for the truth, who want the truth. And some of these are church leaders. Yes. yes. And I think that the attitude in 2 Timothy 2, uh, 22 and following, is the attitude that you and I should have is meekness, is patience, and apt to teach. And, and uh, because in doing so, a person can see themselves. And as, Jesus, as Paul would say, recover themselves from the stand of the devil. Yes, sir. That's possible. All right. Are there any, any other questions? Are there other questions? We appreciate your time. We appreciate your questions. We want to thank uh, Brother Omari French and uh, C.E. Shaw. Uh, great job sharing the Word of God with us today. Amen. And uh, we, you've been a great audience. The Lord wills, we look forward to being back again at 3 uh, p.m. Three great speakers and following the question and answer session. So uh, this time, uh, we want to uh, uh, close out our question and answer session uh, with a word of prayer. At this time, we're going to ask... Uh